And he said, no. This morning we have a great opportunity to, uh, to listen to a great man of God. He is uh, one of our council members, and he's going to share the word with us this morning. Kelvin, come on up here and preach. Well, good morning, New Hopians. Is that a word? It's a word today. Good morning, good morning. I, uh, my goodness, I, I, I'm, I'm surprised at myself to be up here, quite honestly. Um, I just want to thank Pastor for the opportunity or for seeing something in me uh, to give me the, the opportunity to come and tell what God has put on my heart. Uh, we have a wonderful pastor with great leadership. He will throw you out there, sink or swim. <laughs> that's, that's the way he said. So we thank God for him. We thank God for Pastor Kenny and his wife. Pastor Kenny, yeah, go ahead. It, 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 he deserves it. <laughs> um, as I got into the intricacies of, of ministry, I didn't realize how much he does, how many hats he wears. I'm learning so much behind the scene. He really helps keep this boat afloat. And, and you know, we really need to recognize uh, and appreciate what he does for us. Uh, you know, is Jeremy here? Jeremy's not here, but I want to thank God for Jeremy, too. Uh, you know, Jesus wore many hats, many titles. Uh, Jeremy is uh, going to be over the school, but... Nonetheless, he was still pastor. You don't take the title off. Uh, and so we want to always recognize him and appreciate him. And, and I thank God for my wonderful wife. Hey. <laughs> Amen. 30 years she's been with me. Yep, yep. Uh, my buddies still ask me, how did you pull that off? <laughs> I told him it was a hostage situation at first. And <laughs> she decided to stay. Uh, but uh, I thank God for her, uh, her support. You know, I, I wasn't really nervous too much until I was talking to two friends of mine. And um, I said, hey, look, pastor asked me to speak tomorrow. I want you guys to pray for me. And the one friend said, what, cra- what pastor crazy enough to put you up? That didn't get me, but the other one goes, Right? Uh, that, that's when I thought, okay, maybe I ought to give this a second thought, but it was a little bit late. Uh, but we thank God for him, and we thank God for you guys. You guys, we've been here for two years. Last month, we celebrated two years at New Hope, and uh, three years in the Quad City. And since we've been here, you guys have been so wonderful to us. You know, the Bible said the gift will make room for you and bring you before great men. Uh, and so God sees you as great. And if he sees you as great, so do I. So I thank God for all of you. You have treated us so wonderful. The weather sort of sucks. I don't know if that word sucks is in the Bible, but it ought to be. Uh, we've been through a hailstorm. We had a hail the other day. We were in a hailstorm. Who gets hail in the summertime? I don't, I don't, you know, tornado and flood and 45 degrees below. And, and it's got to be the dandelion capital of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you guys have been so great. The people are just wonderful. Uh, well, all but one guy. I went, to this, I went to Menards, and this guy told me what to put on my, my lawn. And he neglected to tell me that I'd have to cut it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. <laughs> so everybody else has been great, but that guy, I'm going to catch him in the parking lot, and uh, we're going to talk about this, because I'm not too happy with him. But everybody else has been wonderful, and I just want to thank you all for that. I do. I do. Don't mind me. You get used to me. I'm a little crazy. Not as crazy as Pastor Scott, but I'm a little crazy. Um, If you will, go to the book of uh, Genesis chapter 37. We're going to start at verse number 3. I'll show you how this works for me, and it helps me. I need your help. Uh, my responsibility is to get it to you. Your responsibility is to try to receive it. I'm going to keep going until I think you got it. So if you help me and respond to the word of God, I know you got it. Now, 
Now, we could be here for two hours, or we could be here for 25, 30 minutes. Depends on how much help you give me. You get your friend, your neighbor, and tell them, help that preacher. Tell them that. <laughs> so we can get out of here, and I can go to the buffet and embarrass myself. <clears throat> Genesis 37, verse number 3. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. <clears throat> and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all the brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Hear, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, I were, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep arose and stood upright, and behold, yours stood round about and made obedience to my sheep. And his brethren said unto him, Shall thou indeed reign over us? Shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Now down to verse 18. And now, when, and when Jesus, I mean not Jesus, but Joseph is now coming toward his brothers. And verse 18 says, And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired to kill him. They said one to another, Behold, the dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into a pit, and we will say some evil beast has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. Uh, I want to preach from this subject, you better fight me before I get there. Let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, for this opportunity. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for these people. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will anoint me to hear and to echo exactly what you say, removing nothing and adding nothing. I pray you anoint these people to hear the infallible truth of your word, that they may go, may, that they may go forth, believing it, receiving it, and achieving it under the power of the Holy Spirit. Be glorified in this house, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 1, uh, verse 5 says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before you came out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I set you apart, and I ordained thee a prophet. I ordained thee to be something before you were created. So you were created on purpose, and you were created with a purpose, regardless of how you got here. For God created something and put an, appoint, an anointment, uh, an anointing and an appointment on you and in you. When he says, I ordained it, I equipped you, I authorized it, I also anointed you to do the job. No matter what it is and how difficult it may seem, he anointed you to be something, you can be something. Now, watch this. He anointed you to be it. So therefore, if he anointed you to be a bus driver... You can call yourself an engineer, but your anointing is on that bus. You may have some success, but when God moves on you, it's when he's anointed you to do what he created you to do or be what he created you to be. But likewise, watch this now, when you were born or before you were born, God saw you as what he created you to be. Oh, I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again in French. Before you were born, before you were birthed into this life, God ordained you to be something. So he, he saw you as doing or being what he created you to be before you became. So in the eyes of God, the true you is when you operate in what you were created to be. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, you have to understand that because God knew it before you were born. But many of us got saved at 30, 40, 50 years old. So we didn't come into our God consciousness, so we've got 40, 50 years 
of the world talking to us and junk in us that was preventing you from being the real you. Oh, it'll come, it'll come, it'll come. Right. Now we could be here for two hours. <laughs> And so you've been, as you were, were living out your life, you've been hit with all kinds of dilemmas and trials and trauma and tragedies and circumstances and bad experiences. And we have a tendency to chalk it up to bad luck. But I submit to you it's not bad luck because there is a carefully orchestrated plot against your life designed to undermine the authority you're supposed to have later on in life. And because we went through so many tragedies and made so many bad decisions before salvation, we have a tendency to believe that we have been recompensed for past decisions. But the battles you're fight facing today have nothing to do with the past, but everything to do with the future. For the enemy knows locked within your heart and locked within your loins, down in your spirit, God had a plan and a purpose for you. And he has to fight you before you get to that place where God had called you because there the anointing will be upon you. And he cannot defeat the anointing of God. So I'm telling you, you're going to come to a place when you realize what God had called you to do and called you to be, and you will have authority over the enemy. You will have power over darkness. You will rule and reign with Christ Jesus. And there's nothing he can do to defeat you. So someday you're going to have to stay, stand up and face the devil and tell him, you better fight me before I get there. Because once I get there, once I get to where God said was mine, I'm raising havoc in your kingdom. We're going to speak things that be not as though they were. We're going to put salvation around the, uh, the quad city. We're going to overcome darkness, cast out demons, put sickness under our feet, poverty under our feet. And all of his hope for destruction will be over. Amen. So he's got to fight you before you get there. Amen. Tell your neighbor, you better fight me before I get there. <laughs> you see, the enemy will sometimes see things on you before you see it because he's been watching you all your life. The word, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. It's the word principality, RK. We get the word architect. It's a governing spirit over a region. Like a king has a kingdom, a prince, a principality has an area. And it will govern an area, and it will see what he can, uh, uh, what manipulates and what it happens over a particular region. And then he hones in what goes over a particular family, what makes them tick, what makes them go good, what makes them go bad. Then he hones right in what makes you tick and what makes it negative for you. And before you're born, when you're young, I mean, and growing up as a child, he's writing up a blueprint, trying to prevent you from being you. Oh, oh, oh. Ooh, my goodness, it's quiet in the house today. Man. And so he watches you, like when you're young, like he did with Moses, he tried to kill him as a deliverer. Like he did with Jesus, I got to kill the Messiah before he's born. Like he did with David, he's in the field, he's, he's fighting off lions and tigers and bears, oh my. And, and, and he did the same thing for you. Monitoring you, watching you as a child to prevent you from being the real you because the anointing will be on the real you. Mm. Many of you, many of you have the gift of encouragement. It oozes out of you. It, it oozes out of you so much so that when you come into a room, you smile, and your smile makes others smile, and you haven't said a word. And the enemy begins to attack the things that are important to you. So you are so discouraged, you don't have any courage to give anybody else. Oh, goodness. Okay, I'll stay. I'll, I'll keep coming. I'll find you in a minute. Some of you have the gift of generosity. You're filled with compassion. When people are hurting, 
You want to bless them, but you can't bless them because he's attacked your, your finances, your car, your furniture. You lose a job. It, 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 all these things are to prevent you from being a blessing to others. Some of you, God will put somebody on your heart. Two days later, you run into them. And the first thing you say is, girl, I was just thinking about you. But because the enemy attacked the things that are important to you, he attacks your, 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 your marriage, he attacks your little son, boo-boo, he attacks everybody. When you get on your knees, you're praying for your marriage, you're praying for little boo-boo, and you never in step into the office of the intercessor. See, the enemy is trying to prevent you from stepping in what God had called you to be. And he attacks you early so that you don't have the confidence when the door opens. And you begin to get hit and wounded in certain areas. I don't care if it's a baby out of wedlock. I don't care if it's a loss of a job. I don't care if it's a divorce or abandoned when you're a child. You get wounded in the area, and you begin to lock the very door that God wants to bless you through. But God will send a word. He will send a word to deliver you because the entrance of his word bring light and understanding. And all of a sudden, you begin to know who you are and whose you are in Christ Jesus. And you begin to unlock the very door and you begin to tell the devil, I'm no longer a victim. I'm not blaming everybody. I'm not making up any more excuses. And you begin to open up the door and you say, listen, the thing that messed me up I'm now going to use it as a weapon against you and testify of the power of God, how he changed my life. In spite of the mistakes that I made, God stepped in and changed my life. And then you tell the devil what entered into my life as a weakness, coming back out in the strength. You might have hurt me there, but you didn't kill me there. And you should have killed me while you had the chance. You should have killed me while you were able, but now I got too much faith in me, too much word, too much power in me. And I'm going somewhere big in God. So he got to fight you before you get there. Come on, tell somebody the fight is on. Tell them that. Clearly, you know I came to target specific people. If you come to church, in this church, and think that it's business as usual and cavalier about it, then, then I'm probably not targeting you. So I'll come back now, you hear? <laughs> but obviously that wasn't on the paper. Y'all forgive me. I just, that's why I got to pray all the time. God, keep my mind. It's all these thoughts. But, but what, 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 I'm targeting the people who know that the hand of God is on this church. And the anointing is on this ministry. And, and if the anointing flows down, the anointing is on the house. And if the anointing is on the house, then the people of God can be anointed too. And if the season is ripe and the water are stirred and the anointing is flowing in the house, you can now jump in and be anointed to do what God called you to do. So now is the time to get in the game. Look at somebody, tell them, get in the game, man. Get in the game. Get in the game. Sitting on the sidelines. I'm targeting people who know I got something on my life, and I know God is up to something, and I want to be a part of something big. I'm targeting people that say, I don't care how, much, uh, times I met, how many times I messed up or made mistakes. I just want to be used of God. I'm targeting people who say, I don't care what my age is, what I lack in strength, I got double portion of wisdom. I just want to be used of God. I'm targeting people who say, I don't care about my education or the lack thereof. If he can use a cock to crow three times, he can certainly use me. <laughs> Anybody in this house want God to use them? Shout, use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. I'm targeting the people who know God is up to something big and they want to be a part of it. 
but I'm targeting people who also, who have been through the battle, who have prayed through some things and understand what the enemy is trying to do and is willing to put up a fight and had to go through some struggles but still maintain their course. I'm targeting people that are warriors. Any fighters in this house today? Yeah. Amen. Now, Joseph. Joseph was the favorite son because his father had him at an old age. Put your hand on yourself and say, I'm highly favored of my father. And he gave him a coat of many colors. The coat was a, a symbol of the favor of God or favor of his father. And the coat was a gift. He didn't earn it. It was a gift. And it distinguished him from everybody else. And God gives you giftings, talents, abilities that distinguishes you from everybody else. That's your coat. And the coat was loud. It was colorful. It was noticeable. But God designed it to be loud. You see, God didn't give you gifting, talents, and abilities to sit in the corner. He wants you to get involved and utilize them so that he can see, people will see the glory of God coming through you. And he gives them a coat of many colors. And his brothers didn't like it. But God had to know, or his father had to know, if I distinguish you in this fashion, it's going to bring opposition. And I'm going to tell you, when you are favored of God, some people are not going to like you. You can do nothing to them, but they're going to hate you because they ain't you. I don't care what you say, it's just a favor of God upon your life, and people will find things that are wrong with you, find reasons to complain. People kill me when they find reasons to complain so much about the church, when the church is doing so much for them. It's not perfect. It wasn't until I got here. <laughs> and so I'm telling you, he, he gives you a coat and he brings opposition, but I'm telling you this. Don't you take your coat off of nobody. Don't you take the favor of God off of nobody. Don't you not put your, your gift in a corner and not do anything with it. You just tell him, I'm not trying to be all that. I'm just trying to be what God called me to be. I'm just trying to do what God called me to do, and I'm going to wear my coat and let God use me any way he wants to. And if anybody has a problem with it, you take it up with God. Tell somebody, I'm going to wear my coat. Tell them that. And so he gives them a coat, and his brothers don't like him. But then Joseph has a dream, a dream of dominion of authority. Now, that's got to be a, a, provoke, a provoking statement from a guy wearing a loud coat. They already don't like him. But he says, I dreamed that you guys were going to bow down to me. And the Bible said they hated him for, for his words and for his dream. But he also had another dream that was more grandiose than the first one. He said, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars are going to bow down to me. And his father said, son, are you saying that me and your mother are also going to bow down to you? And he probably was thinking, I should have never gave that boy that coat. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but you see, when you walk with God, you have dreams on the inside. When the favor of God is upon you, you have dreams on the inside. You should not be pessimistic all the time. You should be optimistic. Because God has got, you got, you got God's attached to you. That's the hope of glory. Amen. That's the hope. No matter what you're going through, you ought to have hope and believe that God can pull you out. Let me tell you something else I learned. I don't pick on or bother or talk about people regardless of the situation they're in because I don't know what dream they got on the inside. I don't know what God's going to do with them on the inside later on down in the life. The very, per the very person that you mess with, talk about, disrespect, may be the person God uses to bring you up and out of your problem. 
So I don't mess with people. I don't care if they're in a hoopty. If they got their hands up, I have to believe God is in that hoopty with them. And God is up to something. So I don't mess with people regardless of what situation that they're in. But he dreamed the dream of power and destiny. And all of a sudden, he's going out to the field because the brothers don't like him. And they said, listen, let's get that coat off that boy. Let's say some evil beast has devoured him. And we will see what will become of his dreams. The fact that they went against him validate that God was up to something. The fact that the enemy is against you, it validates your own importance. Because if you don't believe that the dream will come to pass, why are you trying to kill the dreamer? When people come against you, when people don't support you, when people talk about you like a dog, that's okay. All you got to do is look at them in the eye and say, listen, you better fight me while you can. Because there's coming a day that you're going to have to bow down to the plan of God that he has over my life. You got to fight him. And the fight is fixed. <laughs> now, watch this. He gets put in the pit. Some of you are familiar with this story, but indulge me because we got some new Christians here. He gets put in the pit, and he gets sold to Potiphar's house, where Potiphar's wife tried to put the move on him. And she fabricates evidence against him and says, hey, Joseph tried to put the move on me. And he, she snatches his coat and says, I got the coat to prove it. That tells me God gave him another coat. See, if the blessing's for you, the blessing's for you. If people can't hold down who God is blessing. So they put him in jail, but he has integrity. Even in jail, he flourishes. Even at Potiphar's house, he flourishes because God had his hand upon him, like God had his hand upon you. Some of the things that you have gone through, other folk could not do it. But the fact that you've gone through it doesn't mean that you, God is not with you. The fact that you went through it is the fact that is the evidence that God is with you. Am I making sense to anybody? <laughs> Because you could not have gone through it without God. So all of a sudden, he gets put in prison. And he runs across the butler and the baker. And the butler has a dream. And the baker has a dream. And all of a sudden, he has to interpret the dream. He tells the, the baker, you're going to die in three days. You're going to cut your head off. A little gross, but I didn't write it. And he tells the baker, he says, you're going to be restored. He uses his gift. Now watch this as we go forward. Because the, the king has a dream. And they say, well, we don't know what to do about it, but we know a guy who can interpret. See, he was operating in his gift. Let me put a pin in that. I'm going to come back to that. He operates in his gift, and the king gets him, and he says, listen, here's the dream that I had. Seven fat cows, seven skinny cows. The skinny cows ate up the, the fat cows. So he says this. Joseph interprets and says, seven fat cows represent seven great years of harvest. Seven skinny cows represent seven lean years or famine. But because you can store up in the fat years, the skinny cows will eat up the reserve. You follow what I'm saying? Now, two principles I want to talk about really quick here. He used his gift. And his gift propelled him to his purpose. If you will notice, the king put him in charge. and said, okay, that's a great idea. You're in charge. And now he's over everybody except the king. His purpose. But his gift propelled him to his purpose. People ask me often, 
What is my purpose? What is my destiny? Start by using your gift. It will open the door for your purpose. See, people who sit on the pews and do nothing will get nothing. If you don't start doing something, engross yourself in some activity, whether it's at your job or in the church, wherever, that way God will see you doing something, and he will move and open up the door for you to see what you're supposed to be. But if you do nothing, you'll get nothing, and you'll always ask, what am I called to do? What am I called to be? Now watch this. If you do something and it doesn't fit, no harm, no harm. It's just going to walk away. But if you do nothing, you'll never understand. I'm moving to see if you can hear this here. Well, the other thing I'm going to tell you is that he sold his gift to help the king dream. If you ever want to be all that I want you to be, and get your dreams and your purpose to come up there, you've got to learn how to sell, how to serve, and how to put them in. You must learn how to sell whether it's money, time, effort, and you need them in knowledge. You must learn how to sell. The Bible says, give it to the people you have to do, but that's how you get around. Tell a man, keep on the road. But there's another man that's got to let him get your name. You know what you want from God is someone that's going to be you. But another man that's got to let him get your name. If you can get your name, you can get that on the road. You got my stuff. You can never live it from the beginning. Give it up. And tell him, he said, you've got to learn how to serve. You ought to learn how to serve. You must learn how to serve. When I came into you, I got a part of my family. I'm rich and I'm allowed to serve you. Put it in the heart of God. And then he promoted me to the inside, out of the rain. Amen. But I was ready to serve. And then individually, other people be done. Give me what you did. And, you know, whatever we need to do. We love to serve. We love to serve. And you never would have thought the guy in the parking lot, parking lot, the tenant, be up here. We give you the word of God. Because you serve, you humble yourself. God will go to you. So you might have to serve. But we also want to learn how to surrender. You know, we might have a different problem. Because it's not just a very good job, it can be a very good job. The guy has put over you. Regardless of how you feel, the guy has put someone over the ministry, not pastor, that's easy to do. Not pastor, that's easy to do. Other people. And you just feel like you're going to do what you want to do. You're not surrendering. Thank you. 
come to him, that they recognize him, and they all die. The dream has come to pass. Because he that is going to do the work in you shall come to pass. Thank you. 